Alrighty, gather around, folks, as we begin our penultimate chapter. This is going to be chapter 11, Circuits. So we learned a little last uh, week or two weeks ago about um, static electricity. Now we're going to start talking about moving electricity. So, moving electricity. Moving charges creates current, which is given by the letter I. So we have static electricity just sitting there, just doesn't do much. It pushes or pulls against like charges or opposite charges. Now we're going to talk about moving charges. A moving charge creates a current. It's defined by I. It's delta Q over delta T, change in charge over change in time, or how much charge you're moving across some, some space um, or around a circuit, as we'll eventually get to. Um, if you look at the units of I, we, we know the units of charge, those would be coulombs. We know the units of time, that's seconds. So if current is given by charge over time, its units are coulombs per second, or we have a special name for that. We call it the ampere or amps. And amps are abbreviated with the capital letter A. And you've probably heard of amps before. Um, and it's, it, it is indeed the fundamental unit for current. Now, current, as I believe I mentioned last week, is drawn flowing from positive to negative. However, that's not really the way things work. That is just a, a convention that's a holdover from a time before any of this was well understood. Um, we now know that it's actually electrons that move. The protons are stuck in the center of the atoms. The electrons can move around them, and then they can hop over to the neighboring atom, and so on and so forth. And they can follow that chain, hopping from atom to atom, or bumping from atom to atom, and cause a flow of charge. But despite the fact that we draw current as going from positive to negative, keep in mind that it's actually electrons that move. Protons and neutrons are stuck in place. The electrons are actually the flowing charge. Now, whenever you flow charge and make a loop when it flows in a repeating path, we call it a circuit. That's where the word circuit comes from. It's a closed loop. We also talk about circuits and things like racing, but a, a circuit is a closed loop. You finish where you start and you can repeat that as many times as possible or, or as many times as you would like, um, but that's what makes a circuit. So what actually causes current to flow? What's, what's behind all of this? It doesn't just do it on its own. Well, let's think about it. To make objects move, we needed a force. Forces then caused accelerations, changed velocities, caused things, positions to move. To make electrons move, you need what is called an electromotive force, or EMF. Now, EMF is usually given by the Greek letter epsilon. It looks like a little curly E. Um, but we're not going to use that a lot in this class. Um, EMF is kind of a misnomer. I mean, it, force has an analogous term um, to EMF. It's what pushes the charges along, but it's not really pushing them in the same sense that forces push and cause acceleration. The electromotive force is not really a force. Um, it's, it's a voltage or a potential difference, um, which is a phrase that I might use on occasion, but I won't use a lot in this class. Um, but EMF is really just a voltage, and that's really the term uh, we're going to use most in this class. EMF, or electromotive force, is also known as voltage, and voltage is what pushes charge along. And voltage is given by the capital letter V. Um, together, those define two of our big three um, our big three quantities from this chapter, which are current, voltage, and we'll get to resistance shortly. Um, so voltage is what pushes charge along. Let's consider its units. What are the, the units of voltage? If we want to consider the units of voltage, or EMF, um, we're not going to use a definition to figure them out. I'm just going to give them to you. They are joules per, uh, joules per coulomb joules per coulomb. You can think of that as a, an amount of work or an amount of energy per charge. Basically, you know your voltage. That tells you how much energy it gives to the charges in the circuit. Um, but joules per coulomb is not the unit we will use um, in general. 
A joule per coulomb has another name. It is called the volt, and it is also abbreviated with a capital V. So capital V represents voltage, and capital V also represents volts, the unit for voltage. Um, but voltage is not really just a V. It, it really, to have meaning, needs to be delta V, the change in voltage, or the difference in electric potential between two points. Um, when I say electric potential, you can think an, an, an analogously to like gravitational potential. If something is above the ground, it has gravitational potential energy. And how much potential energy depends on where the ground is. Remember, we had to define where where is zero when we were working with gravitational potential energy. Similarly, you have to define where zero voltage is. And we also call that the ground. Something is grounded in electrical terms means that it has a potential of zero. That is the bottom of the electric potential, and you measure above from there. So from one side to the other of a battery, you have an electric potential. A 12-volt battery has a, a ground of zero, and then 12 volts on the other side. So really, voltage is a change in potential. I'm going to be pretty fast and loose, like most books and most uh, treatments of this, and just refer to voltage um, in general. Um, but more specifically, it really should be the difference in two different points. Um, now there's two ways we're going to apply voltage. We're going to be referring to voltage as the potential difference around an entire circuit. And that's what I'll, I'll be calling total voltage or the voltage of a battery. That tells you the entire voltage from top to bottom all the way or beginning to end all the way around the circuit. The other way in which we'll use voltage is the potential difference across a resistor on either side of a component in a circuit. You'll start with voltage on one side, you cross the resistor, you've now got another voltage on this side. If we did a difference, final minus initial, you would see a loss, a voltage drop. You use up or spend voltage as you go across components, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in more detail later. Um, all right, so that's the, the basics of voltage. Now let's get to our last big topic of resistance. So electrons don't just flow freely through wires. If you send an electron cruising down a wire, it doesn't just go forever. It only goes a certain distance, just like if I gave an object a block, a shove across a table, it only goes a certain distance as well. Um, the block and the table have friction. And that friction sort of slowly pulls away the energy. We studied this back in chapter five with work. Similarly, we have an only, only a certain amount of work or energy for each charge. And there is something similar to friction in wires, and that is resistance. So electrons don't flow freely because they have to be continuously pushed. And that is because wires have resistance. There's always that something similar to a frictional force you have to push to, to overcome it. There is always resistance. You have to keep pushing to keep the current flowing. The resistance of a material defines how easy it is to move the electrons through it. Something with a large resistance it is not easy to get electrons through it. You have to push really hard. Something with a low resistance, it's, it's relatively easy to get electrons through it. And we have special names for those two generic cases. Materials with a low resistance are called conductors because they conduct electricity quite well. The charges flow through them easily. And materials with high resistance are called insulators. It is not easy to get electricity to flow through them. Therefore, we call them insulators because they keep electricity in place. And wires are generally um, a combination of both of these. You often have something like copper or gold, a conductive material on the inside, and then wrapped around the conductor is often something like rubber, an insulator, something that keeps the charge in where it wants to be, and then the wire makes it flow where you want it to go. Um, resistance also depends on geometry or the shape of the wire. The longer a wire is, the greater its resistance is. And additionally, the smaller its area, the greater the resistance is. An analogy I love to give people here is breathing through a straw. If you can imagine trying to breathe through a really, really long, really, really skinny straw, it, it would be quite hard. 
if instead your, your straw's opening was wider or the straw itself was, was shorter, it would be much easier to breathe. Uh, same, same goes for resistance. If you have long, skinny wires, they have really high resistance. Think about the tiny filaments inside of light bulbs. There are these skinny, tiny, tiny little wires. They have a high resistance. You push electricity through them, it causes them to glow. That's, that's how light bulbs work. And the opposite of that would be a nice big fat wire, and ideally it wouldn't be very long. It would be very easy to flow charge through it. Uh, one last thought before we call a, an end to our first video, and that's just the units of resistance. Um, and, and its letter as well, the, how we indicate resistance. Resistance is given by the capital letter R, and it has units of joule second per coulomb squared. But I would ignore that. You don't actually need to know that information. I just added it for completeness since we looked at both current and voltage in terms of their fundamental units. The unit you'll be using for resistance is the ohm, which is given by the Greek letter omega. It's a fun letter to write. Kind of looks like an octopus. I like writing omegas, um, though I tend to get a little sloppy from time to time and might lose a leg of my two-legged octopi. Um, but anyway, that covers the basic definitions of what we'll be what we'll be using in chapter 11. Um, circuits depend all about all upon their current, voltage, and resistance. And we're going to look next at how to build some circuits. So stay tuned to our next video.